Hello, and welcome back to the Matt Graham Podcast, the show where the lighting is different every single time that we do an episode. And if you are listening on audio, you have no idea what I'm talking about, which is fine. Doesn't matter. Um, it's been a few weeks since I made an episode, and the reason for that is, well, had quite a bit going on in the old personal life. Um, I'll keep it brief. I'm, I'm going to do an episode with Shayna, uh, probably next episode or the episode after that. Uh, basically diving into what has been going on. But in short, uh, in the last eight weeks, I lost both of my grandparents and uh, found out I'm going to be a father. So that's pretty exciting. So obviously been busy, uh, been traveling a lot. And uh, anyway, we're back. So we're going to answer some Instagram questions today. I put out an Instagram story yesterday saying, hey, doing a Q&A. If you have any questions, drop them on this Instagram story. And so we are going to do that. Uh, I'm going to answer pretty much every question, depending on if they're, you know, relatively decent quality questions or not. So let's dive in without further ado. Oh, we have some housekeeping that needs to get done. Firstly, if you are not following me on all other platforms, namely Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube slash, uh, TikTok, which is kind of the biggest one, probably should have mentioned that, um, be sure to be following me on there. I post all kinds of content on there that you don't see on here. So be sure to check it out. I guarantee that most of you probably found me from one of those platforms. But in any event, if you're not following me on all of them, follow me on all of them. All that being said, uh, we got some questions here and we're just going to dive right in. First question here, what are your thoughts on the motivation slash discipline argument? What they're referring to with this question is motivation or discipline, which is better? Which should you focus on? What matters more? And um, obviously discipline, I don't think that is a question at this point, uh, but that's not to say that motivation is not a fuel that can be used. I kind of liken it to the Nas in Fast and Furious. You don't fuel your car with Nas, you fuel your car with gas because that's the most reliable form of fuel, but... The Nas, you hit the Nas, and I just want to caveat here. Um, I have only seen like one Fast and Furious movie. I think it was the seventh one because I was on a date one time and I got dragged to go see that. So that's my extent. That's 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 my extent of the Fast and Furious universe. But from my understanding, you hit the Nas in order to increase your speed such that you win the race that you are competing in. And so it's kind of that extra boost that you need to get where you need to go. And so that's kind of what motivation is. You don't rely on it for your daily fuel. You use gasoline for that. Uh, but when you need an extra boost, when it's there, when you have the option to hit the Nas, hit the Nas. But you know, when you're thinking about every single day, uh, what should I be focusing on to achieve my goals? Discipline, fall back on discipline. If you fall back on motivation, you're going to start on Monday. You're going to do the, you're going to be on the hamster wheel for the rest of your life. The, I'm going to start on Monday, Monday rolls around, you're motivated. You lose your motivation by Wednesday and then you start on Monday once again. And then your life just goes into this yo-yo pattern. And that's basically the reality for most people. However, if you cultivate discipline, if you cultivate the, I'm going to do what I need to do regardless of whether or not I feel like it, then of course you are going to actually achieve your goals and your life is going to be happy. And you're going to get more motivation than you otherwise would because what fuels, what, what provides the most motivation is actually achieving your goals. You are the most motivated to continue showing up to the gym when you see the results, like when you start to see those muscles pop, when you start to see the, the scale go down, when you start to see your abs pop, like that is where you get the most motivation to show up again. So uh, rely on discipline to make those achievements. And then once you get those achievements, you'll get that extra boost of motivation. And then you can just hit the nas and keep on driving. Second question, when dealing with an anxious mind, how do you snap yourself out of it and push through? I do what I can. Uh, that's honestly it for me. I just do what I can. Because if I'm anxious about something, then that means that there's some degree of uncertainty. And I can do something about that, hopefully. So for example, when I was my most anxious, like peak anxiety mat, 
uh, back in 2018, I was very concerned about my health. Health anxiety was something that was like very prominent in my in my consciousness. And I was the WebMD guy. I was going on Googling every single symptom that I had. I at one point thought that I was having an abdominal aortic aneurysm because I felt like a heartbeat sort of feeling in my stomach, in my abdomen, when it's really just like my my aorta pumping blood, like it's totally normal. Um, but of course, you Google pulsating feeling in in abdomen, you know, and you'll get abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is a, which is, I, I know somebody that died from that. So not super helpful, but could I have an abdominal aortic aneurysm at some point in my life? Sure. Could I get cancer at some point in my life? Sure. Could I have a brain aneurysm and drop dead right now? Sure. Those things can happen. Is that scary? Yes. Do I have any control over those things happening? Yes and no. I do have some degree of control over my health, right? I can get in shape. I can eat healthy foods. I can go outside. I can drink water. I can make sure that my vitamins and minerals and everything are all taken care of. I can get adequate sleep. Um, I can reduce my stress. There are a lot of things that I can do. There are a lot of actions I can take every single day to reduce the risk of some sort of health emergency. And so that's what I do. I try to make as I try to reduce the risk as much as possible by taking action, by doing what I can. And everything else that I don't have control over, my genetics, uh, t- like luck, chance, fate, stuff that I have absolutely no control over, uh, you have to let those things go. You have to learn to let those things go, and that's very tough to do. But it's much easier to do when you sleep at night knowing that you have done every single thing that you possibly can in order to uh, have the best possible outcome. And that's what I do. So there are a lot of things that I have gotten stressed over you know, in the last few years, uh, one of them being money. You know, There are times where I was stressed about money and stressed about you know making ends meet and paying the bills and what have you. But at the end of the day, I can only do so many things in order to make sure that things are going in the right direction. So for example, if I'm not applying for any jobs or I'm not learning the skills that I need to learn or I'm not sending the emails that I need to send or I'm not making the the cold calls that I need to make, then I then I'm going to feel like I'm going to feel much more stressed than I would otherwise feel if I was doing all those things. You know, because I could go to bed and be like, okay, things are not how I want them to be, but at least I know I have done everything that I possibly can. If, if it doesn't pan out and things go the way that I, that I do not want them to go, the worst possible outcome, be it with health, finances, whatever, relationships, if the worst possible outcome happens, it at least wasn't my fault. At least I did everything that I could and it was just meant to be that way. But if you leave something on the table, if you leave one stone unturned, if you don't cross a T or dot an I, you're going to know that you could have done something differently. You're going to know that you could have given more. You're going to know that you could have tried harder. And that was a choice. You chose to be in that scenario. It wasn't fate. It wasn't destiny. It wasn't God. It was you. And so if you're anxious about the potential outcomes in your life, I would suggest doing everything you possibly can to make them go in the right direction. And the chances that they do go in the right direction are pretty high if you do everything that you're supposed to do. The world has a kind of way of working it out like that, where if you do what you're supposed to do, you get the outcome that's supposed to happen. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes bad things happen regardless of what you do. And that's a moment where you just have to let it go. That's a moment where you just have to, whether you're, you give it to the universe or you give it to God or you give it to whatever deity you believe controls reality. I believe it's God. 
So when we have certain situations where we've done everything we could and things are going the way they're going, regardless of what I have chosen to do, that's God. That's not me. And I have to learn to let that go. Because in my belief, in my faith, I believe that there's a greater purpose for everything and that everything bad that happens, even though I tried to make it not happen, everything bad that happens, it's, there's a greater purpose behind it. So that's my answer for that one. Next question. Are you worried or anxious about becoming a father? Great question. Uh, and I wasn't going to answer this one, except I probably figure that we're not going to get into this uh, with my wife. So I will touch on it now in the event that we don't talk about it in the next podcast. Um, to answer the question, am I anxious or nervous or worried about becoming a father? Uh, yes and no. I'm anxious and worried about the health of my child, about the health and safety of my child. That's it. I, that, and it's a very hard thing to let go of. And I understand that that's going to be the reality for the rest of my life, basically. And it's just a new obstacle that I have to overcome. And it's a new thing that I have to learn to let go of. I had to do the very same thing with myself, with my wife, and now I have to do it with my son, which is arguably going to be the hardest thing to do. Um, but yeah, of course I'm worried about the health and safety of my son. That's, that's going to be my number one concern for the rest of my life. Uh, so to that extent, yes, I'm worried. Yes, I'm anxious. Yes, I'm nervous. I just want everything to be fine. I want her to be healthy. I want her to be safe. I want my wife to be healthy. I want her to be safe. And that's it. Um, am I nervous or worried about being a father? No, not at all. And I know that probably sounds arrogant and I know the parents that listen to me are probably rolling their eyes like, oh, Matt, just wait, just wait till this happens. Just wait till that happens. There's not a manual that comes with parenting. And I fully understand that. I, I'm not posturing as if I have all the answers. I don't. I know that I don't. I would be naive to think that I did. Um, but I'm not afraid of scenarios where I don't know the answers. I'm not afraid of scenarios where I don't know what to do. I'm not afraid of scenarios where I have to just figure it the fuck out. I'm not afraid of that. Been in scenarios like that before. And I'm sure with a child, it's even more intense. But I'm not scared of it. I'm not scared of it. I know that we can figure it out. I know that we're going to figure out whatever uh, comes our way. And that's I have a lot of confidence in that. I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be difficult. I don't, I don't underestimate any of that, but I believe in my values. I believe in my beliefs. I believe in my, in, in, in my value structure. And that as long as I adhere to those values, as long as I, you know, remain strong in, in, in the values that have been instilled in me by my parents, um, then we're going to figure everything out and I'm not, I'm not worried about it. You know, I, I'm very much a cross the bridge when we get there type of guy. And so I'm not going to worry about anything that hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to worry about, you know, what college, whether or not he's going to go to college when he's not even out of the womb yet. You know, like I'm not even thinking about those scenarios. I, I am, I am, I try to live in the present as much as I can in terms of like dealing with today's problems today. Do the work that is in front of you and do not think about anything else. Obviously plan for the future, be prepared, do all those things. But day to day, I'm not up in my head worried about like who he's going to be down the road. He's not even here yet. Let's worry about today. And today my wife is pregnant. That's what I'm worried about. She good. Cool. Baby good. Cool. I'm going to do my work. Then when tomorrow comes, we'll deal with tomorrow. And when we don't know what to do, we'll fall back on our values. We'll fall back on the lessons that we learned from our experience, our parents, um, and everything and, and, and everything that made us who we are. So that's kind of my take on that. I'm worried about making sure that my son is healthy and safe and normal and happy. 
And then beyond that is a bonus. So, yep, that's my take on that question. Advice for someone struggling with sexual urges and lust. Yeah, I mean, so as a dude, I'm assuming this is a dude, uh, as a man, that's a very tough thing, especially if you're someone with a high libido, high sex drive. It's a, it's a difficult thing to navigate, especially in this world with a lot of temptations. You go on Instagram, you go on TikTok, you go on Twitter, you go on, you know, any name any social media platform. There's some degree of sexual temptation on there and and something luring you in to indulging in your sexual desires. One thing that's very important to point out about sexual urges is that they are temporary. If you get hungry, like genuinely hungry, not just like I'm bored, I feel like eating. Uh, if you are genuinely hungry, then you need to eat, right? If you're genuinely thirsty, you need to drink water. Otherwise, you'll die. But if you have a sexual urge, there is no universe in which you need to indulge in it. There's no universe. There's no, there's no reality in which you have to indulge in that or you're going to die. So the first thing I would point out is that it's not, it's not, a, it's not, it's not necessary. You don't need to indulge in it. So it doesn't, it doesn't hold the same value as, any, as, as another urge, right? The reason you get that urge is to reproduce, that's why we have sexual urges. That's why sex feels good. It is a reward for perpetuating the species, for reproducing. You perpetuating the species into your sock or your toilet or a, or a tissue, that is not what it's meant for. And therefore, the desire you get to do those things is pointless. It's not useful, not necessary. Don't got to do it. And, uh, so that's the first thing. Understand that those desires don't have, don't hold the same weight as your other survival instincts, hunger, sleep, uh, thirst. You don't do those things. You die. Your sexual urges don't fall into that category, even though they're just as important because obviously perpetuating the species and reproducing is something that you ought to do. But you're not going to die if you don't indulge in them. So that's the first thing to point out. The second thing to point out is that they're temporary. If, you, if you're hungry and you don't eat, you're going to die. You're going to continue to be hungry until you die. Same thing with thirst. If you're thirsty and you don't drink, you're going to still be thirsty. And then you're going to die. But if you have a sexual urge and you don't indulge in the sexual urge, it'll go away. And your life will continue as normal. So awareness is very key here. You have, to, you have to watch yourself as if you are a third person watching you. Does that make sense? You have to step outside of yourself when you, when you sense those urges and say, okay, hang on a second. I feel this thing. I know I don't need to indulge in it. Okay, that's the first thing. I know I don't need to indulge in this. And I know that if I wait, it'll go away. Or if I go do something else, it'll go away. And this is where self-awareness comes in. You say to yourself, okay, I noticed this. I don't need to indulge in it. And if I just give it time, it'll go away. And that's kind of all the advice I have. I don't have some magical meditation or any other thing like that. You just have that understanding. I don't got to do this. I'm not going to do this. And if I don't do this, life goes on. And I gain a sense of confidence because I gained, I had that tiny little win in my brain. I, 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 I can claim a victory in that moment that, that if had I indulged in it, I'd feel guilt and shame and all the other things. You know what I'm talking about, Right? You indulge in it, and then you feel like a complete piece of trash after. 
You know what I'm talking about. So the next time you feel it, notice it, say to yourself, I don't got to do this and I just got to wait. And then you move on. The last piece of advice for this particular question is um, don't put yourself in scenarios where you're tempted to fail, right? So if you tend to indulge in your sexual urges in the bathroom, don't bring your phone into the bathroom, right? If you always find yourself on your phone in the bathroom doing the thing you're not supposed to do, don't bring your phone in the bathroom. Make that a rule. And by the way, you're going to save so much time because how often do we go into the bathroom with our phone and just end up scrolling? It takes, it takes, I don't know, a minute to 15 minutes to go to the bathroom. But we're in there for 30 because we're, we're scrolling on TikTok or watching a YouTube video. Same thing with eating. Like, why do we have to watch something while we eat? Just eat your food and then go, go move on. But that's, that's irrelevant. The point is, if you find yourself in certain scenarios, like if it's, whether it's in your bed or, or in the bathroom, or you go, you go to a certain app and that, that starts the snowball of, ooh, you see, the, you see the pretty girl in the bikini. Ooh, uh, let me go to her page. And then you, know, you do the whole thing. If that's you, you should probably not be on that app anymore. Don't put yourself in scenarios where you're likely to fail. So that's the best advice that I have on that. That's the deepest I've gone into this topic. Um, so hopefully that helps. How to practice having a more logical mindset. Well, I will say that I am a very logical person, almost to a fault, where I don't really, I don't really uh, listen to my emotions when it comes to making decisions in life. Um, almost never. That used to not be the case. Um, but intrinsically, I would say genetically, I am more predisposed to, to being logical. If you met my father, you would completely understand why I am the way that I am. Um, but you'd also understand, you'd also question why I sit here on the camera and talk to millions of people, uh, via the internet, because if you met my father, you would know he's a very, he's a, he is a serious introvert and does not like attention. Uh, but in any event, I am a very logical person. Uh, that was not always the case. And the way that I went from having more emotion to less emotion is just practicing detachment and self-awareness. And it really just boils down to what I was talking about with the, uh, with the guy that can't keep his PP in his pants. Um, the, the guy who was dealing with, uh, sexual, sexual, uh, lust urges and whatnot. You just have to have self-awareness. You have to have the self-awareness to, to, to observe yourself in the scenario you're in and, 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 and look at, look at things as they are and say, okay, I'm feeling an emotion or in that guy's case, I'm feeling an urge and I have a choice here, right? Just being able to do that alone is going to help you have a logical mindset. Like that, that's it. That's really what it, all it is. It's really all it boils down to. And, um, just observing the scenario and saying, okay, I have a choice in this scenario. I feel this way. Why do I feel this way? And what am I going to do about it? And if you can have that conversation in your head, if you can stop in the moment and say, okay, hang on, I'm angry. I'm angry because of this. What is the best way to rectify the situation? And almost never the answer is continue to be angry or act angry. That's almost never the answer. And the same goes for when you're sad. The same goes for when you're, when you're depressed. The answer is rarely to stay within that emotion. The reason you feel an emotion is because there is something in your environment that is not the way that it should be. Because if everything in your environment was the way that it should be, you would feel content right? Or you would feel positive emotion. Positive emotion is your brain basically saying, things are good. This is good. Do more of this. And negative emotion, anger, sadness, whatever, 
That's your, that's your brain saying something's wrong here. And so at that point, it's up to you to take that information and observe the situation and be like, okay, I feel this way. Is something actually wrong here? Because sometimes there isn't. Sometimes you're just angry because you're fucking angry. Sometimes you're sad just because you're sad. And sometimes you're, sometimes you're angry and sad and all the negative emotions and there's nothing you can do about it. Someone died. What are you going to do about that? There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. So sometimes you just got to accept it. You're fucking sad. That's fine. You should be sad. People dying is fucking sad. However, if you feel an emotion and something's broken in your environment, something could be better, make it better. That's really all it boils down to, I think. It's really just having that conversation and, and being observant. Being observant not only of everything around you, but yourself too, right? Because we get so wrapped up in our emotions, we don't even realize how completely irrational we are. You know, I know I, I've, I've found times where I've just been a complete jerk, a complete asshole. I've said things that I don't believe because I'm angry, because I'm sad. And so you have to work the muscle of like stopping and looking at yourself and saying, okay, did the thing that I just, did the thing that just came out of my mouth, is that true? No. Okay. So what, what's going on here? And you have to do this in real time. And then you have to have the humility. If you do something wrong because of an emotion, you have to have the humility to be like, okay, that was wrong. I didn't mean that. And uh, I was just angry and I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have acted on that anger. And, uh, you know, no matter how logical your, your mindset is or how bulletproof your mindset is, you're still going to slip up. You're still going to have moments where you act on emotion, even though you shouldn't, nobody's ever going to be perfect. Uh, but you can work the muscle certainly, and you can work the muscle all the time because throughout your day, whether it's your boss saying something mean to you, or you drop something on the floor or, you know, your kids spilt, uh, spilled fucking spaghettios all over themselves. Like you have, that's your, that's your opportunity to work that muscle. It's really those little like nagging everyday scenarios where you have that opportunity to practice that. And then you can, then, then it, it prepares you for the bigger moments, you know, where something where you actually have a real reason to be mad, where you actually have a real reason to, to be sad. And there's a difference between feeling sad and being sad, right? There's a difference between feeling angry and being angry. You can feel angry all you want. You can feel sad all you want, but don't do sad shit. Don't do angry shit. And I think that's what strength is. I think strength is feeling a certain way and acting the way you should act despite the fact that you feel a certain way. If you're at a funeral and you're sad that this person died, but you have a responsibility to do certain things whether it's deal with the logistics of the funeral, whether it's to say the eulogy at the funeral, whether it's to, you know, demonstrate strength for your kids or whatever the case. Like that's what strength is. You can, you can cry, you can be sad, you can do all those things, but doing what you're supposed to do despite that, that's mental toughness. That's mental toughness. And that applies to everything. It applies to when you feel tired, when you feel lazy, when you feel bogged down, when you feel, 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 feel. You audit your feelings and you say, okay, I feel this way, but I'm going to do this because I should do this. I'm going to do what is right, even though I feel this way. If you can master that, you can master fucking anything. <laughs>